हेलो अमेजिंग पीपल सो हाउ आर यू ऑल होप यू ऑल माइट बी एब्सोल्युटली परफेक्ट एंड एंड फाइन हेल्थ एंड डूइंग सुपर अमेजिंग सो जस्ट टेल मी वन थिंग दैट हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू यू ब्रश योर टीथ ट्वाइस अ डे या आई सेड दैट राइट एंड यू हर्ड दैट राइट आई एम आस्किंग हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू ब्रश योर टीथ twice a day well at least once a day you should brush your teeth otherwise you know you're going to your teeth and your mouth is going to smell really foul and no one is uh, you know no one would generally like to have a good conversation with you right so always having a you know good healthy teeth will always uh, will always help you to stand out in the crowd in fact so we are always conscious about that right so i just want to know that how many of you brush your teeth twice a day uh, like uh, just tell me in the comment section See, basically, why I'm asking this? It's very, very simple because I know that you all brush your teeth, and that's very, very normal for everyone out there. So, basically, well, have you ever checked out at the back of your toothpaste, like whatever toothpaste you're using? At the back of that, you might be seeing the ingredients that have been put on that toothpaste, right? So, basically, there's one ingredient called fluoride. Fluoride is generally used for you know whitening of teeth and you know giving that uh, particular smile to that teeth or that brightening that smile and all so there is a lot of advertisement there in the market you know who uh, they are certain toothpaste that claim to make your uh, teeth sparkling white however however that is completely different in different circumstances but that is one kind of mineral that is very much utilized in toothpaste apart from that you must have seen your sister or your mother wearing some beautiful piece of jewelry right for example gold jewelry then silver jewelry right so they look very fascinating very amazing so basically when you were talking about this gold silver tin and you know, iron and copper then we have aluminium so what are we basically dealing with we are here we are dealing with a very very simple term that is minerals right and not only this if you are driving a if you are driving a like a, you know car or if you are riding a bike you are utilizing certain kind of fuel for that right maybe petroleum or maybe diesel so those petroleum those diesel those coal you know all these are sources of energy they produce some kind of energy that in turn help you to operate multiple gadgets multiple vehicles and multiple mediums of transportation and what not right so basically our discussion for the next one and a half hours or two hours is going to be it's all about the minerals and energy resources a topic from your geography book so what we are going to do is we are going to elaborately study about all those important points and for the next one and a half hour and two hours i am going to be a host your dost and your ghost as well so stay connected and stay tuned till the last of the video because you are going to learn something more than what is given in the books so that's a small hint because i have lots and lots of things in store for you so basically you are going to learn something more something extra and to learn that you have to be very patient and very very uh, diligent i must say as well okay so let's get started let's let's have a quick insight of what we are going to do today we are going to talk about minerals what are minerals and we are going to talk about their classification how are they classified then what next we are going to talk about the metallic and non metallic minerals then we are going to talk about the conventional energy sources and the non conventional energy sources and after that i am going to say you bye bye right so that's how the course of the entire discussion is going to be now let's begin with that because we have less time and you know what i always believe that study should always be amazing entertaining rather than being extremely long so what i'm trying to do here is i'll try to cut short the time period so that you can learn it in the most interesting and the most amazing way right let's let's get started okay so if someone ask you that what is a mineral so what is a mineral in very simple layman's language it is a homogeneous naturally occurring substance right that means human beings they don't have anything to do with this this naturally occurs in nature okay naturally occurs in the environment it's a homogeneous substance that means having similar kind of uh, like you can say similar kind of uh, properties in many senses right definitely their physical and chemical properties are going to be different depending upon from where they are extracted but in that case their composition is going to be more over identical in nature so we can call it that it is an homogeneous naturally occurring substance with a defined internal structure minerals are formed in variety of forms in nature right so they are formed in rocks especially trapped in rocks they can be obtained from igneous rocks they can be obtained from sedimentary rocks so there are multiple 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 ways in which we can find minerals so rocks and combinations rocks are the combination of homogeneous substances called minerals so basically mineral is nothing but a natural substance that occurs naturally in the environment and that has certain physical and chemical properties with a definite structure and we utilize that minerals for multiple uses for multiple purposes right now 
Okay, so how do we classify the minerals? What are the various ways in which we classify the minerals? So basically, we classify the minerals in three, three categories. Metallic minerals, non-metallic minerals, and energy minerals. When we are talking about metallic minerals, we again divide them into two categories or three categories. Ferrous, non-ferrous, and precious. So when we talk about ferrous minerals, it very simply means, it very simply stands for something that contains iron, right? So it means iron containing non ferrous means something that does not contain iron right and precious means for example the metals that have the minerals that have really good amount of economical value right for example gold and silver so the jewelry the piece of jewelry your mother is wearing is definitely an expensive one right so that belongs to the category of the precious minerals so how do we categorize them we categorize them in three parts that is metallic non metallic and energy minerals and out of that as well we have divided the metallic minerals further into three parts ferrous non ferrous and precious where ferrous means something that contains iron okay non ferrous means something that does not contain iron and the last one that is precious something that is really expensive and valuable now when you talk about metallic minerals okay when we talk about the non metallic minerals the major ones are mica salt potash sulfur limestone marble right so that does not have any kind of metal content now energy minerals when you talk about energy minerals so basically they are those minerals that produce some or the other kind of energy right so basically coal petroleum natural gas these are the best examples of energy minerals now let me get a mineral and again come back so what i'm going to do is very very simple i'm going to tell you that how do these minerals occur in nature okay so we find the minerals in different forms so minerals they occur in the different forms in nature so when you're talking about minerals they are generally found in ores so ores are basically those particular rocks you can tell where we from which we can extract a particular mineral right so all the minerals are found in the ores so the term ore is used to describe an accumulation of a mineral mixed with the other elements so there are multiple impurities definitely we have to refine and take out the mineral or extract the mineral from an ore an ore has certain kind of impurities that it needs to be get refined it right so basically we just cannot simply utilize uh, an ore because it has certain amount of impurities along with that so basically what we do is with the help of certain chemical and physical processes we just take out or extract out the mineral from there and then we utilize it for multiple purposes right so this is how it goes on now let's talk about more about this so how do the minerals occur number 1 the very first point is that is in igneous and metamorphic rocks so that is that number 1 when we talk about igneous and metamorphic rocks so basically there are certain cracks in these rocks right so suppose if this is an igneous rocks there might be certain cracks certain openings in these rocks or you can say that cracks crevices folds or joints so there might be some kind of deformities in a particular section of rock and there we can find the mineral trapped so the smaller occurrences with if we have found if you are finding a minerals in smaller amounts right so these smaller occurrences are generally called as veins and the larger one are called as lodes so how do we define them the smaller occurrences the smaller uh, you can say the smaller quantities or smaller amounts that are present in these rocks they are called as veins and the larger ones are called as lodes now in most cases they are formed when minerals in liquid or molten and gaseous states are forced upward through cavities towards the earth surface so what happens basically this is the earth surface these are the rocks now inside the earth surface we know that there is immense amount of pressure right so there is both heat and pressure there is both heat and pressure and due to this heat and pressure there is an upward thrust very very simple so what is happening whenever something is pretty much heated right there will be convection currents in that the air above that will also be heated and constantly what is happening below the earth earth surface there is a push that is coming in the upward direction so what happens gradually when these minerals in their molten form or the liquid form they try to escape to the earth surface right in such cases you will see that either they get solidified along with the rock and later on they can be extracted out from there so this is how the minerals they reach to the surface of the earth so they cool and they solidify as they rise major metallic minerals if you talk about are tin copper zinc and lead and they are obtained from the veins and lodes so basically veins are the smaller openings and lodes are the larger openings so when you are getting the minerals in the smaller quantities in igneous and metamorphic rocks so we call them as veins and we are getting them in the larger ones we are getting we call them as lodes right now 
moving on further when we talk about the sedimentary rocks that is the second way second form in which we can find the minerals now sedimentary rocks have a speciality they generally exist in the form of layers right sedimentary rocks existing in the form of layers so if you talk about uh, nlz minerals to be very specific right if you talk about minerals like petroleum coal natural gas so they can be found entrapped in these layers of the rocks right so they are very good sorts of them so in sedimentary rocks there are a number of minerals that occur in beds or layers so they have been formed as a result of deposition accumulation and concentration so basically what is happening uh, millions of years ago let us say millions of years ago there were plants and animals which died and they got mixed up with the soil they did dead bodies and dead remains it got mixed up with the soil over the period of time that started decaying and decomposing and gradually this uh, got arranged or accumulated or gathered in the form of layers right now these layers or these rocks are very well utilized in the form of minerals we extract the minerals out of them refine them and then use it for multiple purposes the coal and some forms of iron have been concentrated as a result of long period of this great heat and pressure so what is happening see what is happening suppose this is the remains of something okay these are the remains of a particular animal or a plant now they died they started decomposing natural natural process right few more animals and plants died they also started decomposing so what is happening this particular organic matter is getting accumulated or gathered and putting certain kind of pressure as a result you will see that it will start decomposing it will go start seeping down going down or you can say that there will be multiple layers that will keep on forming here right so these are the basic processes and later on when they have got solidified then they can be extracted in the form of minerals or they convert into some of the other kind of minerals so another group of sedimentary minerals that includes gypsum potash salt and sodium salt these are formed as a result of evaporation especially in the arid areas arid region means where the rainfall is very scanty or very scarce we don't have much amount of rainfall so here whatever amount of water whatever amount of uh, moisture or, or any other property was available in that case if that got evaporated basically then that has resulted these minerals to form so they are formed by generally evaporation in the arid region which are that group so basically that group is gypsum potash salt and the sodium salt right now moving on further the next 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 important way in which minerals occur that is another mode of formation involves decomposition of surface rocks and the removal of soluble constituents now what happens suppose for example there is a rock and this rock is being acted upon by certain elements maybe it can be wind it can be water right so certain amount of elements are basically acting on this rock right so what happens this rock starts decomposing this rock uh, this rock starts decomposing this rock starts okay uh, you can say that weathering weathering or breaking away so this finally leads to the removal of the soluble constants okay whatever is soluble whatever have the property of mixing very easily so that are basically removed as a result some kind of residue or leftover is there okay of the weathered material of the weathered rock that is broken and being washed away or being degraded okay that contains some kind of ores so bauxite is formed in this way so that is another way uh, basically when we try to extract the mineral from a weathered rock right from a weathered or broken up rock so that is again another kind of way residue means something that is left out so residual mass of weathered material so suppose there was a rock that started weathering that started wearing away because of multiple physical elements that are acting over it and whatever residue is left out whatever leftover is there of that rock from that we are extracting a mineral that is also one of the way of getting the minerals now placer deposits that's a one mark question very important that's a one mark question please make a note of it all all of you and you should always keep a pen and paper handy you know that is really amazing why it is amazing because it will always give you the opportunity to note down something that's really really important right so it's very very important that what you have to do is you always keep a pen and paper handy whenever you are watching the video right now let's let's talk about that so there are certain minerals that occur as alluvial deposits in sands of valley floors and the base of hills so when you're talking about at the foothills at the base of hills there might be some minerals that are trapped in the soil right so they are accumulated in the form of soil or alluvial deposits and these deposits are called as placer deposits and they generally contain minerals which are not corroded by water so basically they contain the minerals which are not affected by water which are not taken away by water which are not corroded by water right so that is the speciality about the placer deposits now 
Gold, silver, tin, platinum, they are the most among uh, such kind of minerals. So, they are also the precious minerals, you can say. So, most of the precious minerals are formed in the, are found in the form of placer deposits, right? Now, moving on further, oceans are a great storehouse of minerals. We all know that oceans are a great, great storage, right? That, that's one place where you can find huge quantities of minerals. Like, for example, the ocean waters, they contain vast quantity of minerals, but most of them are generally too much diffused so that they are not very much utilized for economic purposes however we do get manganese out of oceans okay we do get uh, common salt out of ocean so if we talk about common salt magnesium and bromine they are largely derived from the ocean waters so ocean beds are also rich in manganese nodules so if we talk about ocean we have certain good amount of this okay so we are able to you know extract common salt magnesium right bromine okay and apart from that we can also you know the bed of the ocean that is also very much rich in manganese so in fact india has got the right to mine manganese nodules from the bed of the indian ocean and that's an exclusive right granted to india right so oceans are also a great storehouse a great powerhouse of of what bacho it's a great powerhouse of getting the minerals right very very simple okay now i have a question for you i have a quick question for you and you need to answer me that question in the comment section. My question is very simple. What are placer deposits? I want that question. I told you that it's really important one, right? So you just need to define me in the comment section that what are placer deposits? How will you define the placer deposits? Come on. The question is all out to you. I, I, I'll give you, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer the question. 30 seconds are more than enough. Though they are not, I do agree with that. But okay, you can take one minute to answer that question. Placer deposits, just you can explain it in your simple way. Okay, so what are placer deposits? In very, very simple, we can explain it out in a layman's language. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting, waiting for you. Okay, that's amazing. That's super amazing. Super, super, super amazing. Super amazing. Okay, I can see some people answering in the comment section. That's super cool. Super, super, super cool. Okay, let me change the color of my pen. Otherwise, it gets too monotonous, right? Okay. So, rat hole mining, this is an important one. It can be asked in three marks. Okay, that can be asked in three marks that what is rat hole mining. So, if we talk about the areas like Jovai and, and Cherapunji that lies in Meghalaya, people with the help of their family members, they basically dug out a long tunnel kind of hole and they try to extract minerals out of it. And however, that is very illegal. So, National uh, Tribunal, National Green Tribunal, NGT has always already banned such kind of activities. Okay, so why it is called as a rat hole? Have you seen a rat's hole? It's like a, it looks like a tunnel, right? So here also the people, the local people, what they do is they try to extract the minerals. Okay, they try to extract the minerals, but in the most unsafe manner possible. They use, take the help of the family members and with the help of them using their age-old techniques, they try to extract the minerals. And that is very risky with respect to life. Okay, and apart from that, that is also not very much legal in the country. So however, NGT has already banned that. So this rat hole mining is very much popular in the northeastern state of Meghalaya. So in most of the tribal areas of northeast India, the minerals are owned by individuals or communities. So there are many tribal communities and they uh, claim their right over the minerals because they have been living in those lands ever since ancient times and definitely uh, they claim that these minerals belong to them and they have the perfect right to utilize them, right? So in Meghalaya, there are large deposits of coal, iron ore, limestone, dolomite. Coal mining in Jovai and Serapunji is done with the is done with the help of family member in the form of long narrow tunnel that is called as rat hole mining. However, the NGT or the National Green Tribunal, the NGT has declared such activities very much illegal and has recommended that these should be stopped immediately it should be stopped right so rat hole mining can be asked in examinations it has been asked in the previous board examination that is why it's very very important so what is rat hole mining basically it's a kind of coal mining in the practice in jovai and cherapunji districts of meghalaya in this the people with the help of the family members that uh, they dig a long narrow tunnel and try to take out the minerals that is very very unsafe and not ethical as well right now Let's talk about the mineral wealth in India. So we see that if we if we analyze the map of India, if we analyze the map of India, if we analyze the geography of India, we'll see that most of the mineral deposits are concentrated either in the uh, peninsular plateau region and some of them lie in the 
northeastern part of the country otherwise if we compare the northern part of the country we will generally see the northern part little bit devoid of the mineral wealth however northern part is very much rich in agricultural terms right so everything has something in this uh, in this country right so basically when we talk about the mineral distribution in the country so that is very very uneven in india right okay so india is fortunate to have rich and varied mineral resources however these are very much unevenly distributed that means the peninsular rocks contain most of the reserves of coal minerals mica and other kind of non metallic mineral so basically it's a peninsular plateau that's a powerhouse of minerals storehouse of minerals biggest storehouse you can say sedimentary rocks on the western and eastern flanks of peninsula that is western and eastern ghat section right very very simple so when you're talking about eastern uh, flanks so we're talking about the eastern western ghat sections eastern western ghats plus plains the coastal plains right so this particular section of india is pretty much full of you can say that lots and lots of mineral deposits like in gujarat and assam they have the most amount of petroleum deposits especially if we talk about assam digboi in assam is the oldest oil producing field in india now there is one more question that has been asked from this particular section that which are the two oldest oil producing states in india so if this question is asked in the examination make sure you are going to give the answer assam and gujarat right and if they ask you the question which is the oldest oil field in india what you are going to answer that is digbo in assam right so digbo in assam is pretty much famous one okay moving on further if we talk about rajasthan with the rock systems of peninsula has reserves of many non ferrous minerals so rajasthan is also very much rich when it comes to minerals so it has deposits of non ferrous minerals rajasthan also has a peculiar speciality with respect to its geography that it has certain elements of the peninsular plateau system as well or the peninsular area as well so as a result of it it has certain reserves of non metallic minerals so rajasthan is very important with that perspective now let's talk about the next one the alluvial plains of north india okay the vast alluvial plains of north india are almost devoid of economic minerals right so these variations are largely because of the differences in the geological structure the topography of the area that is why we can say that the minerals in india they definitely india has rich in minerals but still the distribution of minerals is very uneven when it comes to the mineral distribution in the country right so that is why it's very very important that we have a careful planning of how the mineral wealth has to be utilized in the best possible manner in the best possible manner around now suppose if you are, if you are asked to differentiate between metallic and non metallic minerals how are you going to do that it's very simple we can write two to three points that's very easy to that's very very easy to identify okay number one metallic minerals they will contain metal in the raw form number one point non metallic as the name suggests that will not contain any kind of metals now metallic minerals are generally associated with the igneous rocks and if you talk about non metallic minerals they are associated with the sedimentary rocks now metallic will be generally they will be hard and they have their shine of own if you talk about non metallic they are generally not hard and they do not have any shine of their own that you also call as luster right so basically metallic minerals are more lustrous and hard and they are soft comparatively soft and they are not lustrous as well okay now examples are iron core uh, iron copper bauxite and here we can give the examples of salt coal mica clay so these are the multiple examples that we can quote for the non metallic minerals so what did you understand from this very simple when you are talking about metallic and non metallic as the name suggests metallic will definitely contain metal in the raw form raw forms and non metallic is not going to contain any metal when we talk about the hardness and luster we will see that the metallic minerals are generally hard and they are shiny they have shine of their own but when we talk about non metallic minerals they lack this property that is they are comparatively softer and they also lack the shine apart from that if we talk about the metallic minerals we see that they are generally found are associated with the igneous rocks and non metallic minerals are generally associated with the sedimentary rocks so these are the major point of differences when it comes to metallic and non metallic minerals now let's try understanding the metallic minerals one by one so in this uh, series let's let's first uh try to grasp like what are ferrous minerals so whenever i say the word ferrous immediately one thing should strike your mind that we are talking about iron right the moment i say the word ferrous and remember we are talking about the word iron so if you talk about the word ferrous minerals so it's very very simple the minerals that will be containing iron that is called as a ferrous mineral now 
the ferrous minerals they account for three by fourth of the total value of production of metallic minerals in the country so if you talk about out of the total metallic minerals produced in the country three by fourth are the ferrous minerals itself right now let's try to understand what are the different kinds of ferrous minerals we have so number one we talk about the iron ore okay the number one point is we're going to talk about the iron ore so when you're going to talk about the iron ore we'll find three major types of iron ore hematite magnetite and limonite okay so we're talking about three major types hematite magnetite and limonite so when you're talking about hematite hematite is also known as the red ore okay so we also call hematite as the red ore okay so this contains 60 to 70 percent of pure iron so when you're talking about hematite it is containing 60 to 70 percent of pure iron okay mainly you can find this type of ore in odisha jharkhand chhattisgarh karnataka and maharashtra next when you're coming to magnetite next when we are coming to magnetite so magnetite is also called as black ore it is the best quality of ore so when you talk about if the question is like which is the best quality of iron ore so what are you going to write the answer you're going to write the answer that is magnetite why it is the best quality of iron ore the simple reason is it has more than 70 percent of iron content when you're talking about magnetite it has more than 70 percent of iron content hence it has the best quality of iron ore available right now it possesses magnetic property hence it is also referred to as magnetite now this particular type of iron ore is possessing the magnetic qualities the magnetic properties as a result we are calling it to be we are calling it to be what a magnetite okay so generally in tn karnataka just remember this phrase that is tk tk is tamil nadu and karnataka so you can easily remember that tamil nadu and karnataka are rich when it comes to magnetite deposits right now the third quality of iron ore is the limonite it's the most inferior quality okay so it's very very inferior quality here is it the most inferior quality of iron so that contains only 35 to 5 50 percent of iron and this one is yellow brown in color okay so when you're talking about limonite so limonite is yellow brown in color so as a result when you're talking about the different varieties of iron ore number one we have the magnetite magnetite is the best quality of iron ore as it has more than 70 percent of iron content it is also called as black ore and since it has magnetic properties hence its name can also be very much related to that okay then we have the hematite that is also called as red ore that has approximately 60 to 70 percent of iron content and the poorest quality of iron ore is limonite that has only 35 to 50 percent of iron content hence it is also called as the yellow brown one right now if you go to the regions of garhwal in uttarakhand or if you uh, visit mirzapur in uttar pradesh or if you go to kagra valley in uttar pradesh you are generally going to find the limonite deposits so for finding limonite deposits we can head over to uttarakhand himanchal and mirzapur districts of uh, mirzapur district of uttar pradesh right okay so let's talk about the major iron ore belts in India. So that is a good one because lots and lots of questions are asked from this particular area. And you know what people are at, at times are very much confused how to remember these belts, how to remember these belts, right? First, we have Orissa Charkhand belt. That's OJ belt. OJ, OJ. That is OJ belt. OJ belt is very simple. That is Orissa and Jharkhand. Now, if you talk about Orissa, you will find high grade hematite ore is found in Badam Pahad mines in the Mayur Bhanj and Kendhujar district. So when you are talking about Odisha, we are talking about two important districts. Which are the two important districts? Number one is Mayur Bhanj and second is Kendhujar. You can remember them by the name MK. Right? That's a small form you can remember. MK is Meri Kahani. You can remember like this, Meri Kahani. So if you are talking about Odisha or Jharkhand, that's OJ. Hey OJ, listen to Meri Kahani. So you can use this kinds of mnemonics. Right, so hey OJ, listen to Meri Kahani. On Meri Kahani will be here, will be Mayur Bhanj and Kendujar. And OJ is Orissa Jharkhand. What kind of iron ore is uh, available here? So we get high quality emetite ore. Next. Then we have the Singham district of Jharkhand. So there is an amazing movie of Ajay Devgan called Singham. Remember that Singham, right? So you can remember from Singham, you can remember Singham. So Singham district of Jharkhand also has good quality of hematite iron ore that is mined in the goa and noa mundi district right so that is mined in goa and noa mundi district you can remember this by the acronym good night okay so good night is nothing but goa and 
Nua Mundi. And that is place that, that lies in Jharkhand. Okay. So this is how your Orissa Jharkhand belt lies and the kind of quality of iron ore it has. Durg Bastar Chandrapur belt. We call it as DBC belt. Okay. We call it as DBC belt. DBC is very simple. So you can remember any anything. There are death by chocolate. Wow. DBC, there's a, there's, that's a wonderful desert. If you haven't tried it, do try it. Death by chocolate. Death by chocolate is amazing, chocolatey, very tasty, very delicious desert. You know, it's like, wow. It's like really wow. So if you haven't tried this DBC, do try it. Do give it a try once. That's one of my favorites. Okay, so let's let's remember it by DBC, death by chocolate. So death by chocolate is nothing but Durg, Bastar and Chandrapur belt. So this basically lies in the states of Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. You can remember them by the term CM. Okay, so death by chocolate. CM had DBC. CM had DBC. CM had DBC means DBC is Durg, Basta, Chandrapur belt. Okay, and CM is Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. So basically these are the two states that lie in this particular belt. A very high grade hematites are found in the famous Bella Della range of hills. Okay, so here you can find high grade of hematite ores in which region the bella Dela range of hills that lies in bastar district of chhattisgarh so this hill ranges are lying in bastar district of chhattisgarh now the range of hills comprise 14 deposits of super high grade hematite ore it has the best physical properties that are needed for steel making so this particular particular belt is very very important with respect to steel production okay Right, so basically, this is very, very important. So what we learned, CM had death by chocolate. Death by chocolate means DBC. That is Durg, Bastar, Chandrapur belt. CM stands for Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. Very high-grade hematite ore is found where in Bela Dela Hills. Okay, remember that Bal strolling on the roads. So that Bela Dela Hills of uh, Bastar district, Chhattisgarh. We have 14 such deposits of super high-grade hematite ore he present here. And that's very much useful in the steel production. So it holds a great importance with respect to steel production. Okay. Not as the best physical qualities. Iron ore from these mines is exported to Japan and South Korea via Vishaka Patam port. Right, so you can imagine that that is also very important with respect to the exports there. So, what is happening here? What is happening here? The iron ore that is from these mines that is exported to Japan and South Korea even via Vizak port or Vishaka Patam port. So that is the importance of your DBC that is Durg Bastar Chandrapur. Okay, now. Let's talk about another uh, another amazing amazing belt. It's uh, this is my personal favorite. You can remember it like a tongue twister, Bellari, Chitradurga, Chikmangaluru, Tumkuru belt. So you can just remember it like a tongue twister, Bellari, Chitradurga, Chikmangaluru, Tumkuru belt. Or you can simply remember it by BC square T. Okay. So that is how you can remember it like BC square T, BC square T. You can remember it by this formula as well. BC square T is Bellari, Chitradurga, Chikmangaluru, Tumkuru. So, uh, I, since, uh, you know, a lot of time I have been practicing this tongue twister, that's one of my favorite. So, it might be a little bit difficult for you in the first attempt, but still don't worry. Keep on doing it. You will start loving it after some time. And that's how it happens with me. Okay, now let's talk about this. So, basically what is happening, this belt in Karnataka has pretty huge reserves of iron ore. Okay, the Kudremukh mines, Kudremukh means the like uh, horseshoe, right? That's what it means in Karnataka and Kannada language. So Kudrek Muk mines in the western ghats of Karnataka are 100% export unit. What does it mean? 100% export unit means whatever kind of iron ore is produced in these mines, they are 100% exported out of India. Now, Kudrek Muk deposits are known to be the one of the largest in the world. The ore is transported as slurry through a pipeline to a port near Mangaluru. Now what is a slurry? Slurry is a kind of semi-solid kind of mixture, right? So that ore is converted into that mixture and through pipeline it is transported to a port near Mangaluru from where it is exported to other countries, right? So very, very simple about this. Now let's talk about the MG belt. That is MG belt is very simple from Mahatma Gandhi. You can remember MG belt that is Maharashtra Goa belt. So this includes the states of Goa and the Ratnagiri district of Maharashtra. So you should be very, very particular about this. That what does it include? It includes the states of Goa and Ratnagiri districts of Maharashtra. So iron ores are not a very high quality, but still they are efficiently exploited. Iron ore is exported through Marmagao port. Okay. So the iron ore here is exported through the Marmagao port. So all uh, though 
the kind of the quality of iron ore present here is not a very superior quality or very fine quality but still it is exploited to the best possible extent so these are the major iron ore belts that you can find in india right now definitely i'm not asking you to write down all the iron ore belts here uh, present you know just write them all in the comment section i won't ask you to do that because i know that that's a very tedious task okay and i do agree that that's a very hectic one and you won't like doing that but still i'll be asking you to explain me the maharashtra goa belt because that's the easiest and the shortest one so just need to explain me in the comment section you can do that uh, like post the class gets over the session gets over or the discussion gets over so you'll have ample amount of time to figure that out so you can do at that point of time or either if you are feeling very much you know excited and you are you are feeling like no i should answer right at this moment then also you can answer that okay so that's how it is now let's talk about the next 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 kind of uh, metallic mineral that is manganese so manganese is basically used in the manufacturing of steel and ferro manganese alloy right so that is very very important that manganese it utilize in making of it has two basic uses two basic uses that is steel manufacturing and the manufacturing of ferro manganese alloy nearly 10 kg of manganese 10 kg of manganese is required to manufacture 1 ton of steel okay so basically 10 kg of manganese is required to produce 1 ton of steel apart from that it is also used in the manufacturing of bleaching powder insecticides and paints that is why you can talk about we can say that the commercial usage of manganese is pretty huge pretty important very much very much very much you can say very very much important right so that's how it is now let's talk about the non ferrous mineral so basically these were the two kinds of minerals that had iron content in them the iron ores as well as the manganese now we'll have a quick discussion about that what are those minerals that do not contain iron in any sort of form okay so with respect to that that are called as non ferrous minerals that do not contain iron do not contain iron very simple okay it does not contain iron so copper bauxite lead zinc gold these are the major minerals which we can categorize them in the form of non ferrous one so they have huge uses in the metallurgical process processes where we are refining the minerals and all and apart from that they have a usage in engineering process electrical industries so their manifold usage is of your uh non ferrous minerals right now let's move on further let's talk about copper copper is malleable ductile and a good conductor of heat and electricity now that's an, a really amazing point about copper so basically when you talk about uh, malleability and ductility so we will talk about two th important points that is they it can be beaten into sheets it can be beaten into sheets copper sheets can be made out of it and it can be turned into wires so it can be beaten into sheets and it can be turned into wires so that defines its malleability and ductility apart from that it's a very good conductor of heat and electricity that also makes it very much usable in the electronics and electrical industries right so we do use copper wires at home for connecting multiple things especially when you talk about dipavali so we have used it multiple times for connecting the led lights and all those kinds of stuff right now mainly used in electrical cables electronics and chemical industries the balaghat mines in madhya pradesh that's a very important question because it has been asked over the period of time as a pyq i'll tell you that that uh, it has been asked that balaghat balaghat mines in madhya pradesh are famous for dash that is they are famous for copper production apart from that we have khetri mines in rajasthan and singbam district of jharkhand so they are the leading producers of copper so if you talk about which are the leading producers of copper then we have balaghat mines in madhya pradesh khetri mines in rajasthan and singbam district of jharkhand so these three you have to remember so this is really important it has been asked in the board examinations now let's talk about bauxite bauxite is the ore of aluminium like we try to we basically extract aluminium outside the bauxite right so bauxite deposits are formed by decomposition of wide variety of rocks that are rich in aluminium silicates so basically bauxite is the ore of aluminium so when huge number of rocks that are rich in aluminium silicates when they decompose they give rise to the formation of bauxite okay 
so bauxite we remember remember just few minutes back we just studied that there are some kind of minerals that are formed after a rock gets weathered or decomposed bauxite is one of them so this is how the bauxite is formed so in basically the rocks that are rich in aluminium silicates when they start weathering when they start breaking away or deteriorating then whatever is left out whatever is residue left out that basically leads to the formation of bauxite deposits okay now aluminium is obtained from bauxite aluminium has a very good conductivity and malleability it's a light metal so that's why aluminium it utilizes in many multiple purposes for example it find it's find its uses in the airplane industries apart from that aluminium is also used for uh, making utensils at home so there are multiple uses that aluminium is find now it is a very important uh, you know when aluminium was dec uh, discovered uh, um, uh, napoleon right there was an emperor napoleon he felt that aluminium is absolutely an amazing metal so basically he started treating his more prior guests more prioritized guests more important guests by serving them in aluminium dishes because he felt that aluminium is somewhat more important than gold and silver more precious than gold and silver in fact he started wearing you know uh, clothes that uh, whose buttons were made up of aluminium right so that is how important it was however few centuries later that aluminium bowls were uh, there in the hands of beggars and gold and silver they regained back their importance so aluminium is a comparatively cheaper metal when we compare to gold and silver there okay so when you talk about what are the aluminium deposits so aluminium deposits are generally or mainly found in the amarkantak plateau the maikal hills and the plateau region of bilaspur katni belt right so they are the major areas where you can find the aluminium or the aluminium production okay now so let's talk about that which are the different states where you can find the al uh, where you can find the bauxite deposits okay so just like uh, just try to figure it out in goa you can find them in mopa and parnam in odisha we can find them in kalahandi and sambalpur in gujarat we can find bauxite deposits in jamnagar kaira surat and kutch then apart from that if you talk about in madhya pradesh also bachcho we can find it out in jabalpur balaghat shardol mandla and amar kantak in chatisgarh we can find it out in durga durg bilaspur and raigad regions in jharkhand uh, okay so in chatisgarh we can find it for uh, in durg bilaspur and raigad region when it comes to jharkhand we can find it in palamau and rachi region in maharashtra we can find bauxite in thane kolapur ratnagiri districts in satara karnataka we can find that in belgaum mainly at the karle hills and apart from them in tamil nadu we can find the bauxite deposits deposits in salem nilgiri areas madurai and coimbatore right so these are the major areas where you can find the bauxite deposits so this is an additional chart that's not given in ncert so make a point that whenever you are downloading the notes right from the physics wala app for this particular batch make sure you make it uh, make a proper note of it in your notebooks right so that is going to be very very helpful for you very very helpful right okay so if you look at the bauxite if you look at the bauxite production okay so if we look at the bauxite production one thing we can make out that if we talk about the largest producers of bauxite so largest producer of bauxite here is odisha it's a clear winner okay so largest producer of bauxite here is odisha we can say that odisha produces 65% of the total bauxite After Odisha, we can find Jharkhand producing ten percent, Gujarat nine percent, Chhattisgarh six percent, uh, Maharashtra six percent, MP three percent, and rest of the states one percent. So, we, if you talk about which is the largest producer, this question is again a PYQ, right? Remember, this question is again a PYQ. It has been asked in the examinations that which among the following is the largest producer of bauxite in the country. So, whenever this question erupts, basically you have to write the answer that is Odisha. So, largest producer of bauxite is Odisha. Okay. now let's talk about that let's move in further okay so moving on further from bauxite let's let's come to the non metallic minerals so basically we are done halfway through our different kinds of minerals we'll talk about non metallic minerals and after that we'll talk about the energy resources the hazards of mining and how to conserve them right now when you're talking about the non metallic minerals first of all how they are formed they are formed by deposition and hardening of skeletons remains of animals and shells and as well as it is found in almost every states of india right so if you talk about non metallic minerals uh, basically that does not have metal content so here we are in particular talking about limestone let me be very specific with this so here we are talking about limestone that how is limestone uh, formed and like what are the processes behind that so when you are talking about la 
ओके लेट मी लेट मी गेट वेरी करेक्ट सो दे इज अ स्मॉल स्मॉल कंफ्यूजन है लेट मी लेट मी जस्ट करेक्ट इट आउट फॉर यू लेट मी जस्ट करेक्ट इट आउट फॉर यू ओके तो राइट सो बेसिकली वेर टॉकिंग अबाउट द नॉन मेटालिक मिनरल्स है सो विल जस्ट स्टार्ट डिस्क्राइबिंग सो बेसिकली वेन यू टॉक अबाउट हाउ दे आर फॉर्म सो नॉन मेटालिक मिनरल्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल दे डू नॉट कंटेन एनी काइंड ऑफ मेटल्स राइट सेकेंड इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट वेन यूर टॉकिंग अबाउट सेकेंड इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू द लाइम स्टोन फॉर्मेशन राइट सो वेन यूर टॉकिंग अबाउट द लाइम स्टोन फॉर्मेशन इट्स वेरी वेरी पर्टिकुलर वेल लाइम स्टोन आर समथिंग दैट हैज गुड अमाउंट ऑफ कैल्शियम कॉन्टेंट्स राइट सो लाइम स्टोन विल ऑलवेज बी फॉर्म वेन एवर वी हैव वेन एवर वी हैव Uh, remains of skeletons, you know what are skeletons? They are made up of bones. Bones are made up of calcium content, right? So basically, they are formed by the deposition of skeletons, the decomposition of the animal and plant bodies over a period of time. So that basically leads to development of limestone, right? So limestone present in most of the uh, places in India itself, and limestone is a very very important mineral when it comes to the cement industry. So for cement industry, it's like a savior. So limestone is very very important. It's find its uses there. Limestone is one of the metallic mineral. next we'll talk about mica so let's talk about the characteristics of mica so mica easily can be split into thin sheets apart from that these sheets can be so thin that a thousand can be layered into a mica sheet few centimeters high that means suppose these are so thin sheets that if i start stacking them one over the other you will only find a few centimeters of uh, total elevation that these sheets will gain so if we'll start stacking mica sheets one over the another that like thousands of mica sheet will only make up only a few centimeter of the width so that thin is the mica sheet right now mica can be clear it can be black green it can be red yellow or it can be brown so multiple multiple kinds of you can say colors mica can have now due to its excellent dielectric strength low power loss factor in insulating properties it's a very very good uh, you know uh, you can say mineral for with respect to your electrical industry so what are the properties of mica that it has excellent dielectric strength it has low power loss factor apart from that it has good insulation properties and it is resistance to high voltage right so it's very resistant to high voltage so that's why mica is pretty much used in you know uh, electric and electronical industries because we know that we need good resistors there in order to you know certain ob objects and appliances to function well so that's why you can say that mica finds a great usage because owing to the kind of properties is that so it that's perfect combo for the electrical industries okay now let's move on further so when we're talking about the non metallica let's uh, non metallic that let's talk about mica's uses that what are the different uses of mica okay now when we're talking about mica's uses number 1 it is used as a flux in the iron and steel industry now what's a flux basically when you're talking about iron and steel flux is basically a substance that is added in order to a little bit you can say uh, make the process little bit more faster okay so when you're talking about the smelting of iron and steel in order to make the process little bit more faster we add it as an flux okay an additional substance it is used in cement industry as well sometimes okay then uh, fine so there are the multiple uses that we can talk about let let's talk about the mica distribution as well mica deposits are found in the northern edge of chota nagpur plateau okay that is very very important so basically mica deposits are found in northern edge of chota nagpur plateau kodarma gaya hazari bag belt of jharkhand that is again a leading producer of mica apart from that rajasthan is a major mica producing area is around ajmer apart from that nellor mica belt of andhra pradesh is also very important producer of mica in the country right so these are some things that we need to know about mica when you're talking about the uh, distribution of mica that basically chota nagpur plateau kodarma gaya hazari belt of jharkhand rajasthan is also good producer of mica and apart from that nellor mica belt of andhra pradesh is again a very good producer of mica so these are some of the things that we need to take into consideration okay now let's talk about limestone in detail let's talk about limestone in detail so it is found in association with rocks that are made out of calcium carbonates right so limestone is found in association with the rocks that are made up of calcium carbonates or calcium and magnesium carbonates so this is found in the sedimentary rocks of most of the geological formation so i told you that limestone is one one certain mineral that will definitely be formed once the skeletons of multiple uh, animals and plants have got decomposed decayed and then you know they have just stacked up in layers so limestone is generally associated with sedimentary rocks okay now it is the basic raw material for the cement industry and an essential one 
for smelting of iron ore right so this is the kind of uses that limestone finds in the different industrial sectors if you talk about the limestone if you talk about the production of limestone then we can see that which is the largest producer of limestone then we can see that rajasthan tops the list this is production of limestone 2018-19 so in this rajasthan turns out to be the largest producer as per the data okay largest producer if we talk about okay largest producer is mp that, uh, that is okay rajasthan M, uh, then after that we can have mp Okay, so Rajasthan turns out to be the largest producer with respect to limestone, 20% contribution Rajasthan. Then after Rajasthan, we have Madhya Pradesh with 13%, Andhra Pradesh with 13%, Chhattisgarh with 11%, Karnataka with 9%, Telangana with 8%, Gujarat with 7%, Tamil Nadu with 6%, Maharashtra with 4% and the rest of the states with 8%. So when it comes to the largest producer, largest producer of uh, limestone, then we can go for Rajasthan. So this is as per the 2018-19 reports. Okay. Now, let's talk about the hazards of mining. Okay, now what are the different hazards of mining? So basically, mining refers to the process of taking out minerals from the surface of the earth and utilizing them for multiple purposes, right? Now, what are the different hazards that are associated with mining or what are the different things that impact the mining all over, right? Now, the dust and the fumes that are inhaled by miners make them vulnerable to pulmonary diseases. Now, that is again important point. So the workers, those who are working in the mines, they are subjected to huge amount of dust and debris, right? So there's a lot of dust that is going inside their lungs that may cause them many infectious and maybe fatal diseases at times. So that is their, uh, their health is at risk. The risk of collapsing of the mine roofs, inundation, fires in the coal mines are a constant incidence. Now, when we're talking about working inside uh, a coal mine, so coal mine inside the coal mine, it's particular heat and pressure will definitely be there. At times it happens that the roof of the mine, it collapses leading to a huge amount of fatal damage. Many workers die in that. At times the workers may suffocate because of gas leakage or something kind of that incident can always happen. So there's always a danger of this. The water sources in the region, they get polluted. You know what happened? They get contaminated due to mining. What happens? There's a huge amount of dust that that is completely spread out in the nearby vicinity of a mine that settles down on the floor you can say the surface of the water bodies pollutes them gets mixed with them apart from that uh, we can say that you know the dumping of the waste and slurry that leads to degradation of land soil and increase in the stream and river pollution so whatever is waste whatever waste is generated out of mining that that waste is carelessly dumped in the nearby water bodies and nearby land areas that further leads to the degradation of these resources and as well as contributes to the water and the river pollution so we can say that mining is definitely having certain hazards but apart from that is it's again very very important that we need to mine the resources with respect to the country's economy but however we need to find out sustainable methods of mining it out so that is really very very important right now Let's move further. Let's talk about the conservation of minerals, like how the conservation of minerals are very, very important. So mineral sources, we know that they are very much non-renewable in nature. Okay, so very much they are non-renewable in nature. Very much they are non-renewable in nature. They are very finite. So it's very important that we need to use them judicially, right? But the point here is the bitter, bitter truth lies in the fact that we are actually indiscriminately utilizing all the kind of mineral resources available and this is something that is not justified. So a sustainable approach is really important here. Continuous extraction of the ores that has lead to increasing cost as mineral extraction comes from greater depths. Now what is happening? Earlier when there was abundance of minerals available, we can extract them for a very lower depth, you know. We don't have to dig out more to get those minerals. But when we have done over extraction, we have to go deep inside the earth's surface in order to extract the minerals out of there. So that basically adds to the total cost of the mining and the cost of production that is there. And as a result, this higher mining costs are ultimately impacting the whole price economy, right? So that is again a big problem that we are facing. So it's very important that we need to carefully plan the resources, okay, that for that resource planning is important. A concerted effort has to be made in order to use the mineral resources in a planned and sustainable manner. So we need a sustainable planning mechanism. So we need a sustainable planning mechanism. Resource planning is very, very important so that we can manage the resources in the most efficient way possible. Recycling of metals, use of 
स्क्रैप मेटल्स रिमेंबर द थ्री आर थ्री आर इज रिड्यूस रीयूज रिसाइकल reduce reuse recycle these three hours have to be remembered as uh, as a normal people also we can contribute our part we can definitely pre prevent uh, the misusage of resources we can utilize whatever is the requirement we instead of over utilizing the resources so these are the small contributions we as an individual also can give right so instead of uh, like we can use uh, instead of like we can recycle the metals right other substitutes can be found out very very simple we can al always found the alternative sources of you know minerals and energy resources that that's a good alternative like nowadays there is a consensus among the people among the governments to ban the plastic bags because they are you know single use plastic to be very specific because they are harming or damaging the environment so alternatives to plastics can be many natural fibers that we can go with the jute bags that are, that can be used over the period of time we can go with paper bags cloth bags so that can be recycled and reused reused over and over again that is a speciality about you can so basically protecting the environment lies in our hands and without our you can say that without our involve, involve, involvement the environment cannot be protected okay okay fine so now so it's been really long i have been like uh, you know talking with you people out there and i'm just uh, not very much sure that how many of you are really much involved in eating something delicious rather than listening to what sir is telling see because i know that this is always a long one i know that this is always a long one i and i personally feel very bad for you guys you have to stay for the next one and a half and two hours but believe me that is very beneficial for you that is very amazing for you let me get something good for you let me get something good for you what what can i get for you i can get something good for you let me see what can i get for you so what can i get for you here is oh me myself that's very very important so me myself i can get for you it's okay okay so let's get started here so let's get started here so basically what we are going to talk about is we are going to talk about the conventional resources now what do you mean by conventional resource conventional is something that is very very traditional that means that you have been utilizing for a long period of time and you are so used to it or you can say that you have over exploited it in very simple terms it is something that is used by human beings since a long time period and we are still using it most of these resources are polluting in nature most of them are non renewable in nature once exhausted they cannot be refurbished now a good example of this is coal and petroleum right now let's move further about it so coal how will you describe coal coal is simply a combustible solid that is present in the form of layers and those layers are made up of organic material so basically how the coal is formed coal formation has an interesting interesting story we'll just talk about that so coal basically exists in the form of sedimentary rocks now if we talk about the composition of coal we'll quickly see that carbon content is 60 to 90% hydrogen is 1 to 12% oxygen is 2 to 20% and nitrogen is 1 to 3% so that is that is the different kinds of components that are present in a coal now and also it has a small amounts of phosphorus and sulfur when we talk about the formation of coal then accumulation of plant matter in the swampy areas or broad deltas and the coastal plains that has led to the formation of coal then how it has led to the formation of coal let's understand it. it's very simple man see what happens the plant and animal uh, kind of diversity present in these areas like coastal areas the swampy areas right swampy areas are basically you can say an area that is a mixture of mud uh, clay sand and water that is very much sticky sticky area where you don't find it very comfortable to walk around right now so when these plants and animals they started uh, you know when they died they started getting decayed and decomposed so over the period of time more and more deposits more and more animals plants they started dying so once what happened one a certain remains of plants and animals they actually started decomposing then over and over above more and more started dying more and more started decomposing so basically started forming a layer and under intense heat and pressure this particular layer they got stratified they got you can say collected or jointed at one place and gradually under the different physical and chemical changes that that they went through and under the immense heat and pressure in the earth surface they started turning into fossil fuels or you can say uh, in very simple term one of them is coal right so basically the physical and chemical changes that led the conversion of this vegetative matter into coal So by heat and pressure generated, and by the weight of overlying deposits or overlying sediments. So basically, what is happening? Suppose very, very. Let's start. Uh, let's start with a very individual example. So what is happening here? 
so there was there was a certain plant vegetation it died it started decomposing with the nearby soil that was present few more plants died they also started decomposing so what is happening there is a stack getting built and this stack is continuously pressurizing the one which is present at the lowest end right so this pressure is comparatively creating layers and over the period of time under intense heat and pressure and under different chemical and physical circumstances they started converting into coal and this is how your coal was formed right and apart from that the earth movements are also equally responsible because we have tectonic plates that are in constant motion beneath the earth surface right so they constantly keep on moving so that is another important factor out there right so basically these movements compiled with the uh, heat and pressure inside the earth surface and the multiple physical and chemical changes it led to the conversion of the matter organic matter into coal right so that is how your coal was formed very simple terms now we when we talk about coal we have four different varieties of coal anthracite bituminous peat and lignite so all of them they have certain amount of carbon content right so based upon that we have divided the coal into different sections let's talk about the very first one that is anthracite now anthracite is the hardest variety of coal available it is shiny jet black in color it has 90% carbon content the best quality of coal available is the anthracite coal it has 90% of carbon content out there right apart from that it burns slowly without smoke okay and it burns for a longer period of time and leaves a very less amount of ash behind so ash is basically that powdery substance that uh, that is getting produced on burning something so that is called as ash and not talking about the trainer of pokemons that is uh, that ash is different okay so we are talking about the ash that is produced after burning of particular substance here right so basically here we can see that in the anthracite variety of coal the ash produced is pretty minimum so we can say that it burns completely or you can say it burns to the maximum possible extent the best quality of uh, coal present around in the market that is anthracite having 90% of the coal content that's carbon content right it has a high heating value and it's very good for the domestic uses purposes however there is one unfortunate point out there that is india lacks a good amount of anthracite deposits so we generally have bituminous coal a lot but when we talk about anthracite deposits we lack in that okay now when you talk about the second variety of coal that is bituminous coal so it has a speciality that it, it is hard black and it is compact compact right so it makes up 80% of the world's total coal output if you talk about the total coal output across the world globally 80% of it is present in the form of bituminous coal carbon content varies here from 50 to 80% the steam coal basically the coal that is used in production of steam that holds the maximum carbon content of 80% right so that is the best quality of bituminous coal available otherwise the coal that is used for the household purposes domestic purposes that contains only 50 to 80% of carbon content cooking coal is again a high grade bituminous coal so this is specifically having industrial uses like it has a special value when heated in the coke ovens this fuses this joins with the coke coke here does not mean the coca cola that you are drinking here it's an industrial fuel that we are talking about we are talking about a kind of coal variety we are talking about a formation of coal so basically it has a very special uh, quality that it's a very important ingredient in iron and steel industry in the blast furnaces so bituminous kind of coal so basically the best bituminous coal is the one that is uh, very useful in production of steam and all okay so because that has 80% of carbon content so if you talk about bituminous is the major industrial coal that we call uh, that we that is present in india right so it's basically the usage of bituminous coal is very much there in the industrial sector now apart from that if we are talking about the third quality we have is the lignite coal now lignite coal is also called as brown coal that's a speciality it's a lower grade coal the carbon content is here is very less that is just 40% it contains moisture and apart from that it has less combustible matter that means if you are trying to burn a lignite coal it's not going to burn in that amazing manner and also it will leave behind a lot amount of ash that is again a significance that it's not a very good combustible substance okay now when you're talking about the peat so peat is basically that represents the first stage transformation of wood conversion to coal so we also have coal in the market that is also called in hindi we call it as lakdi ka koila so what is lakdi ka koila basically that is a wood that has converted into coal under immense heat and pressure and the different physical and chemical changes so what is happening this is represents the first stage of transformation where wood has got converted to coal it has the least amount of carbon content it is an accumulation of vegetable matter so basically that trees and all their trunks and all they got decomposed they got decayed gradually under heat and pressure started transforming into coal so basically it is being found by two processes that is decomposition and carbonization so this is again the lowest quality of coal present around that is peat 
right now okay so that's a whole lot isn't it i know it's a little bit difficult to digest everything at one go but gradually if you go along across with the flow of the lecture believe me you're going to enjoy it however minerals and energy resources i do agree doesn't have a story all around it it is more factual in nature where we are discussing about ranks we are discussing about production we are discussing about the different regions where coal exists it may not interest to some people at times but you know try to think like a researcher that how you are going to do it try to just think like a researcher that you are a researcher who is trying to figure out something you are a person who is trying to you know figure out something you are trying to tell you oh, no have to do it right so just study like a teacher i already told in one of my videos study like a teacher five amazing techniques that will make you learn smarter not harder so here you have to study like a teacher make yourself very much you know accustomed to the topics make yourself you can uh, very much friendly to the topics start thinking in the best possible ways and also if you feel that you can you know give me some another amazing trick if any trick is going on in your mind you are most welcome to place that in the comment section as well okay so let me not more it uh, make it more lengthier for you let me cut short for every, uh, like for you guys okay so uh, let's talk about the coal distribution out here okay the coal distribution so if we talk about the rank of india in coal production so after china and us india ranks third in the world in terms of coal production okay so that means india has certain good amounts of coal if we talk about the coal fields then the oldest coal field is present in rani ganj west bengal and if you talk about the largest coal field that is present in charia that is in jharkhand so when we talk about the coal deposits we generally found them in two different categories number one we have the gondwana deposits that are more than 200 million years old and second we have the tertiary deposits that are just 500 55 million years old okay so when we're talking about the coal deposits in the country we have it in two categories the gondwana ones gondwana ones are more than 200 million years old and when we talk about the tertiary deposits they are just 55 million years old little bit more than okay now india lacks in the anthracite deposits that i told you that that's very unfortunate that we as a country we lack in the anthracite deposits however that's a little bit unfortunate if you're talking about the gondwana fields the coal of the gondwana fields is mainly bituminous so if we're talking about the gondwana fields here so mainly gondwana fields contain uh, they contain the bituminous variety of coal okay let's talk about the gondwana deposits gondwana deposits or the gondwana fields they contain 90% of the total coal reserves of india if you talk about the total coal reserves of india 98% of them at made about made out of the gondwana deposits now the coal that is present in the gondwana region is free free from moisture and it contains sulfur and phosphorus this coal finds its uses in the steel plants right so in the steel plants this is particularly utilized so it has a great usage in the steel plants apart from that if you talk about the major states the major areas of this gondwana region where you can find the coals then we have the river valleys of damodar mahanadi and godavari the major states that lie in the gondwana region coal fields are west bengal jharkhand odisha chatisgarh madhya pradesh maharashtra parts of uttar pradesh andhra pradesh and telangana so they are the major areas you can find in the gondwana field deposits right so these states basically they account for 4 by 5th of the india's total coal reserves so that important is your gondwana coal reserves right when you talk about the tertiary deposits here the moisture is high that means the coal is not pretty much suitable for the usage so that's why the majority coal is extracted out in the gondwana region it has more sulfur and lower calorific value major deposits you can find in the northeastern states of india that is uh, assam arunachal meghalaya nagaland also alternatively you can find them in kashmir as well okay so lignite occurs in the coastal areas of tamil nadu now tamil nadu has some really good lignite deposits okay so lignite occurs in the coastal areas of tamil nadu gujarat and some areas of rajasthan like neveli is the largest lignite deposit in southern india like neveli lies in tamil nadu okay so neveli in tamil nadu is the largest lignite deposit of the coal in southern india right now if you talk about what are the advantages of coal what are the advantages of coal see whatever i have told you here i have told lots and lots of things here that will be still missing in your books that's why i'm again and again reiterating the fact that please do download the notes from the physics wala app that's absolutely free of cost you don't have to pay anything out there okay so but please do download it because this is going to be really helpful for your board examinations okay you are always are getting something extra to write 
so basically will never uh, run out of points so if you are not remember remembering an x amount of point x point so you can replace it with some x point okay or some y point now let's talk about what are the advantages of coal number one it's a source of power it is used to run certain machine ships and at times multiple types of engines okay apart from that it is used for manufacturing of iron and steel it's a source of direct heat and energy used for the domestic purposes especially if we talk about the rural households nowadays also the uh, rural households they make utilization of the coal for their cooking purposes it is used for building uh, making building materials now it is used as a raw material in the thermal power point so coal is used as a raw material to produce steam and that steam in turn gen uh, it basically uh, you know rotates the turbine and hence the electricity process moves on so basically it is used as a raw material in the thermal power plants as well okay so let's 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 little bit move further let's let's little bit move further so let's talk about that what are the disadvantages of coal what are the different different uh, disadvantages with that we can talk about so basically if you talk about the calorific value of the variety of coal that is found in india that's pretty low okay so the calorific value of the variety of coal that is found in india mostly it is bituminous that is pretty low in nature coal reserves are scattered and present in small amounts that we cannot find coal reserves in one particular section they are very much distributed very much scattered and that too they are present in the smaller amounts high cost of production and transportation that is one point limited reserves of coal large scale pollution is also caused by burning of coal both at the mining site wherever the coal is mined and apart from that wherever the coal is utilized both places will experience good amount of pollution high level of pollution so that is again environmental degradation factor right so with respect to coal now the next in the sequence another 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 fossil fuel is your you can say that petroleum so these are also called as energy resources okay petroleum is made out of two words that is petro and oleum petro means rock and oleum means oil so basically it it is an oil that is taken out inside the rock from inside the rock right so rock i am not referring here to dwayne the rock johnson okay <laughs> the one from wwe and a very famous actor from hollywood i am not referring to him at all okay however he is my favorite but still i am not referring to him here we basically talking about the oil the crude oil basically that is entrapped in the rocks and we generally drill it out or take it out so it means rock oil it's a complex mixture of different hydrocarbon compounds it's also known as liquid gold now the reason behind why it is called as liquid gold is very simple each and every part of this crude oil this petroleum is utilized not even a single part is wasted hence it is called as liquid gold right now when you find the petroleum in the liquid form we call it as crude oil when you form it find it in the gaseous form we call it as natural gas and when you find it on the semi solid to solid forms we call it as asphalt tar pitch bitumen etc okay so three different forms we have witnessed here what are the three different forms liquid form gaseous forms and solid forms in liquid forms we call it as crude oil in gaseous forms we call it as natural gas and in semi solid to solid forms we call it as asphalt tar pitch and bitumen so basically where you can find petroleum you can find them in sedimentary rocks like sandstone limestone shale etc okay now so when you talk about this when you talk about this entire thing let's let's little bit discuss it so like what are the advantages of petroleum okay so what are the advantages of petrol when you talk about petroleum 1 kg of crude oil has a potential of producing 10000 kilo calories of energy can you imagine that so 1 kg of crude oil has a potential of producing 10000 kilo calories of energy it is used as a fuel out of this crude oil we are able to derive multiple products for example we'll just name few like ethane diesel gasoline lpg jet fuel or the kerosene then after refining the crude oil is can also be used as a raw material in the petrochemical products like synthetic rubber fiber pvc phenol okay so multiple multiple products it can be utilized now apart from that it is also used for making the printing ink the ones you use in the cartridges of printers and all then apart from that the film photography where you used to you know the film that is made out so in order to you know just uh, take out the pictures and all and cosmetics as well vaseline petroleum jelly who can forget that right especially during the winters we try to lubricate using that vaseline you know our lips and all basically they turn out to be dry during the winters so however this is an amazing one right so cosmetics are also made out of petroleum now let's talk about the disadvantages we had enough of advantages of petroleum right so let's let's little bit talk about the disadvantages of petroleum that what are the disadvantages number 1 that is it's non renewable in nature it's a fossil fuel petroleum is running out of the you can say it's already running out of stocks 
and the world the world on an average has very less amount of petroleum left for the next coming years right so pro it produces greenhouse gases on burning that contributes to global warming climate changes like factors okay so that is again very environmentally de uh, environment degrading now high cost because of the limited supply we all know that there are very limited producers of petroleum all over the world and as a result petroleum at times it basically you can say it regulates the price economy all over the world so basically it's regulating the markets all over the world the demand is pretty high for petroleum because every country needs that for multiple uses but the suppliers of petroleum are very much less as a result you can see that gulf countries are immensely rich why petroleum is a reason the biggest reason there because they are one of the largest producers of petroleum in the world and they have that particular command to decide the price of the petroleum because they know that the demand is huge in the market and they are the real suppliers and if they are the suppliers and that too in a crunch market then definitely they are having that power to regulate or monitor the prices right so basically that is one of the important point it's highly inflammable it can cause fires definitely petroleum can very much cause fires very very soon it will catch fire can lead to loss of aquatic diversity what happens the petroleum is transported over the oceans in case of an oil leakage oil spill that entire oil is going to deposit on the surface of the water and that will make it very difficult for the aquatic life to inhale the oxygen that is present in the water leading to the light scale death of fishes and other kind of aquatic life forms so again that's a great hazard to environment we must say right so for our benefits we are sacrificing someone's others lives so that is really bad okay now Let's talk about the next kind of uh, extraction that we get out of it. So basically, natural gas, it uh, also called as petroleum gas, it occurs along with the crude oil. So natural gas generally can be bifurcated into another two dimensions, that is LPG and CNG. So LPG is basically the liquefied petroleum gas that you generally utilize in your households. Okay, and we have uh, CNG that is compressed natural gas. Uh, this cng when it is used for domestic purposes this is called as png okay when it is used for domestic purposes it is called as png otherwise used for the commercial purposes it is called as cng generally as a fuel for the transportations right now so natural gas is found along with the petroleum deposits and is released when crude oil is brought to the surface so basically when we uh, take out the crude oil when we bring out the crude oil to the surface along with that natural gas is also released now it can be used as a domestic as well as an industrial fuel. So when it is utilized in the domestic purposes, it is used as PNG. When it is utilized in the industrial purposes, it, it is used as CNG. Right? Remember this. Now, it is used as a fuel in the power sector to generate electricity for heating purposes in industries, raw material in chemical, petrochemical, fertilizer industries, as a transport fuel. For example, if you talk about Delhi, most of the things are now CNG run and not only daily, most of the cities, especially if you're talking about the auto rickshaws, right? The auto rickshaws are most clear, most probably they're getting, they're coming nowadays with the CNG kits fitted there. So they are completely, they have switched over to CNGs, right? So it is also used as a cooking fuel. I told you in the form of PNG. Natural gas is an emerging preferred transport fuel and cooking fuel at homes. That is again a very, very important uh, aspect of the natural gas. So natural gases can be derived in two different forms. That is... Uh, in the form of LPG or in the form of CNG as well. Liquefied petroleum gas, liquefied petroleum gas and CNG. So CNG is basically compressed natural gas, right? So natural gas is generally also referred to as petroleum gas. We already saw that when we we're talking about petroleums. Okay. So when it is used for the domestic purposes, we call it as PNG. When it is used for the industrial purposes, we call it as CNG. So that is the basic difference out there. Okay. Now, if we talk about the how the natural gas is distributed in India, so India's major gas reserves are found in the Mumbai High and the nearby fields that are along the west coast of India. Okay. Now, this Kambe lies nearby the Gujarat one. So this is also a very important area of the natural gas production. Along the eastern coast, we have new reserves of natural gas that have been discovered in the Krishna Godavari region. So that is again a very important one. So along the western coast, we find it across Maharashtra and Gujarat. The Kambay area and the Mumbai high area. And apart from that, we are also discovered that some natural gas deposits in the Krishna Godavari area, the Krishna Godavari basin that lies along the eastern coast of India. Right? Now, this is an again a very important one. So please pay attention to this. It's my humble request to all my amazing, amazing and loving viewers out there. So this is a really important one with respect to the pipelines here. So basically, we talk about the natural gas pipelines. The first 1700 kilometer long Hazira 
विजयपुर जगदीशपुर एच वी जे पाइपलाइन ओके देर इज अ स्मॉल डैश हेयर ओके So this HVJ pipeline, we can they can ask you that what is an HVJ pipeline? So it's in 1700 kilometer long Hazira Vijayapur Jagdishpur cross country gas pipeline that is constructed by Gale. Okay, that's a government undertaking company and linked with Mumbai High and Basin gas fields. So basically, from there it carries the gas to multiple areas wherever the gas natural gas is required. Okay, so with various fertilizer power industrial complexes in the western and northern India. So whatever the companies and industries that have the requirement of the natural gas. So basically, these pipelines are used to transport the gas to that certain locations for the industrial or other purposes. Now, this artery, or you can say that this branch or this pipeline, it provides the impetus. It provides the force to Indian gas market development. Now, apart from that, if you talk about overall India's gas infrastructure. Has expanded ten times. It has expanded ten x from seventeen hundred kilometers to eighteen thousand five hundred kilometers of cross country pipelines, and it is expected to reach thirty four thousand kilometers soon as grass grid by linking all the gas sources and consuming markets. Right? Very very simple. So what we are, the government is planning here? Government is planning to basically draw a network of pipelines that will connect the producing sources with the consumption sources so basically we have a demand in the market and that demand needs to be supplied so there are certain people who are producing this natural gas manufacturing it out in the industries and there are certain consumers who are ready to buy them so basically government is basically building up a planning up to expand these pipelines so that it can be uh, you know facilitated that from the sources itself from wherever it is produced it can be transported to the consumers so that is how it can be worked out so this will ultimately boost up the gas economy or the gas market of the country now when you're talking about electricity we all know that electricity is something that is very inevitable to our homes right we cannot imagine our lives like apart from electricity we use it for every other purpose likewise now like for example if i am talking to you guys right now live on the youtube platform or maybe on the any other platform maybe i might be conversing with you on a you know batch that you can view using physics wala app right so basically i'm using a medium that is smartphone or a camera or a a laptop or a computer so all this is uh, uh, getting basically so all this is run with the help of electricity only right so when you talk about electricity this is produced generally in india by two mediums we do have tidal power but that is very limited in amounts but when you talk about electricity so that is generally produced by two mediums here okay and what are the two mediums we have the two mediums that is tidal power and thermal power tidal power and thermal power so hydel means using water we are producing the electricity and thermal here means using heat we are producing the electricity so what happens suppose there is a dam there is a big dam okay it has gates now there is a turbine this is a circular kind of you can say structure it has certain blades over it it is connected to a generator okay it is connected to a generator and this will be further processing the electricity so what happens water falls at a huge speed with a huge force over these turbines with the force of the water these turbines they start rotating they start rotating as a result this induces a kind of current in this particular generator which further magnifies it and supplies it to the respective area wherever the electricity is collected or maybe to a transformer so that it can be further converted into a usable form so this is how the water from water we harness electricity so what we are using here is in dams lot of water is stored right so water is in a stored form will always possess uh, it will have this uh, potential energy so when it is falling with a great from a great height with a great force you know it is having certain kind of kinetic energy certain kind of velocity so basically we are utilizing that energy to transform it into electrical energy and same when we talk about thermal power plant so basically we burn the coal and all okay we burn it we try to produce the steam here then steam is going to rotate the turbine again the same process the team is going the steam is going to rotate the turbine and this turbine in turn is uh, connected with a generator and this generator is finally going to give you the output in the form of the electricity right so that is how the thermal and the hydel power stations work however there is a more elaborate approach to this but still since we are running a little bit out of time so we'll just keep it very short keep it very short does not mean we are not understanding the concept absolutely we are understanding the concept that is required okay so hydro power or hydel power is basically when we produce electricity using the water okay and thermal power is basically when we are talking about produce production of electricity using heat 
so if we talk about 22% of india's power needs 22% of india's power needs are produced by the hydro power however the bigger amount is still produced by the thermal power right so this is basically the electricity is really really important right so when we talk about the non conventional sources we are talking about the alternative sources of energy okay we are talking about the alternative sources of energy and these alternative sources have a speciality they are non or less polluting they are non or less polluting they are renewable in nature they are environment friendly in nature for example we can talk about solar power solar energy wind energy right so these are like the multiple examples nuclear energy tidal power so these are the multiple examples we can always pitch for non conventional sources of energy so let's try to understand them one by one number one let's talk about solar energy basically solar energy can be harnessed in three different ways using solar cells also called as photovoltaic cells that convert the solar energy into electricity okay apart from that we can also utilize it uh, we can harness the solar energy using a solar pressure cooker solar cooker not a pressure cooker solar cooker and also we can use uh, the solar water heater so basically the solar co solar cooker is used to cook meals with the help of the solar energy the solar water heater is used to you know uh, basically warm the water for multiple usage and uh, again solar cells have a single usage what they do is they convert the solar energy into electrical power so when we fuse lots and lots of solar cells together it comparatively makes a solar panel so someone ask you what is a solar panel so basically when we combine lots of solar cells together so that makes up a solar panel so when you talk about solar solar energy so india is a tropical country india has both tropical and subtropical regions that means india receives good amount of sunlight so that ha that makes it very much uh, you know that gives it very much the potential to harness solar energy out of it and especially if we talk about the parts of rajasthan and gujarat they have enormous potential for the development of both solar and the wind energy right but however we have not started that so photovoltaic cell or photovoltaic uh, cell also called as the solar cells so basically what they do is they convert the sunlight directly into electricity solar energy is becoming very much popular in the remote areas of the country and government is also you know taking initiatives to install solar powered lights not only the village areas but also in the urban areas for example if you visit noida sometime that is a part of delhi national capital region delhi ncr so lots and lots of street lights in noida are, are solar powered so that is really cool you know solving a you know saving a lot amount of energy so so big some big solar power plants are being established in different parts of india for example i give you one example of shakti sthal karnataka so it's one of the largest in india right so which will minimize the dependence of rural households on firewood and dung cake so what are dung cakes basically it's a like excreta of the cow that is being made into a cake and utilized for cooking purposes so it is combustible in nature but still that produces a whole amount of smoke and it is also very much polluting in its aspect that's why we in order to replace that dung cakes and all the government is also putting in initiatives to install solar panels in the villages or so that the electricity can be harnessed right so this will not only contribute to uh, environmental uh, you can say conservation but apart from that it will also help to preserve the very important cow dung that can be utilized as a manure in the fields of agriculture because cow dung is a natural manure you know it basically will help to increase the soil fertility so it's very important that this cow dung gets wasted a lot in burning and also it aids to the environmental pollution so why not find out a sustainable way of replacing it so this is one of the examples okay now let's talk about the nuclear power okay so basically what is the nuclear power nuclear power is when you try to harness power from the nuclei of an atom okay very simple and that is very very powerful so what we do is we alter the structure of the atoms and we can generate power out of it now apart from that when such an alteration is made huge amount of energy is released in the form of heat and this is used to generate the electric power so basically what we do is when you talk about a nuclear fission okay fission is what we have done is there's a big nucleus we have divided into two different parts two nuclei now in dividing it into two different parts it will release a huge amount of heat energy we try to trap this heat energy convert it into a steam form and with the help of that steam rotate the turbine and ultimately produce the electricity so that is how the process works now the point is once the reaction is initiated it can you know basically work up for a huge number of time a long period of time 
and the point here is initial cost of setting up a nuclear plant is definitely expensive but maintenance is comparatively cheaper when you talk about in the long run okay so uranium and thorium they are the two radioactive elements that are available in jharkhand and aravalli ranges of rajasthan are used for generating atomic or nuclear power in fact if you talk about the monazit sands of kerala they are also very much rich in thorium now this is important why this is important because this has been asked almost twice or thrice in the examinations that the monazit sands of kerala are rich in dash so they are rich in thorium right so uranium thorium so radioactive elements are used for which for producing the nuclear power okay now so i have a question with i have a question for you you need to tell me that the monazit sands of dash are rich in thorium now you need to tell me the state here it's very very simple if i'm going to give you the state you can easily tell me the mineral but now the question is a little bit reverse now my question is very simple the monazit sands of dash are rich in thorium come on you have 4 seconds to answer the question all in the comment section 4 seconds starts now i'll just wait for 4 seconds only only i'm going to wait for 4 seconds okay right tell it fast Yes, I want to know the answers. Tell it fast. Jaldi, jaldi, batao. Fata, fata se. Come on, tell it fast. Cool. Nice. The correct answer is the state of Kerala. Wow. The state of Kerala is the absolute correct answer here. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Let's talk about the next, next, next set of energy that is the wind power. So wind is absolutely a very efficient and very clean and expensive source of energy. So how do we produce a wind energy? Basically, there are windmills. What are windmills? It's a structure. There will be a pole. Okay. To this pole, there are blades attached, just like a fan, a big fan. And when these blades rotate, they ultimately produce a kind of energy. Okay. That is again connected to the same process turbine, and then further converts to uh, electricity with the help of generator and all. So basically, we are using the wind power here. So this, they rotate and rotating, they produce a certain kind of energy. Okay. So windmills are used for generating electricity. the blades of the windmills rotate due to the force of wind and this rotational motion of the blades is used for driving a huge number of machines okay so whatever electricity is produced out of it we can utilize for you know uh, moving water pumps flour mills electric generators so multiple kinds of machines can be worked upon with the help of this particular energy factor now several wind farms they are installed in a definite pattern in cluster called wind farm so several wind mills let me just correct it a little bit So when when we install several windmills, okay. So when we together when we install several windmills together in a certain area, so that is called as a wind farm, okay. So wind farms are generally installed in coastal regions where you have good chances of you know the breeze blowing, the good chances of wind being there. In the open grasslands and the hilly areas, the Indian Wind Program is one of the is the fifth largest. If we talk about the Indian Wind Program, it is the fifth largest in the world. so we are doing a good amount you can say we are doing good in this particular perspective so if we talk about the india's wind program so that's the fifth largest in the world india the largest wind farm the largest wind farm cluster is located from nagar coil to madurai in tamil nadu right so if someone ask you the where the largest wind cluster located so the largest wind cluster is located from nagar coil to madurai in tamil nadu important wind farms you can also come across in the states of ap as it's andhra pradesh Gujarat, Kerala, Lakshadweep, and Maharashtra. So they are the important places where you can also find the wind farms, right? Okay. Moving on further, let's talk about tidal energy. So basically, what are tides? Let's let's break it down. Let's break down the term. So what are tides, right? Tides are nothing but the periodic rise and fall of water. Basically, that is caused due to the gravitational pull of sun and moon. So when the pull is high, the water rises to a certain level. That is called as a high tide. again they fall that is called as a low tide very simple but this rising and falling of water produces considerable amount of energy which can be tapped so what we do is what we do is what we do is we build certain barriers okay where it is ex it expected that this area experiences tides we build a certain barrier a certain kind of you can say a space where the water can be collected so whenever the high tides are there the water gets collected in that particular area and that that can be harnessed for that can be utilized for producing electricity and again the when are the there are the low tides again the water goes back again what happens so basically uh, just let's let's let me break it out for you otherwise it will get difficult out for you so what we have done is we have built certain barrages okay suppose 
these are the tides again i have this very simple object with me to explain you out this is the barrier these are the tides and this is the space here we have attached a turbine okay turbine is like rotating equipment so when the water is high okay what happens the high water enters into this area it with a force and it rotates the turbine which is in turn connected with the generator it produces electricity again when the water goes back again same process takes place again the water goes back it rotates the turbine turbine is connected generator it produces electricity so basically this rising and falling of generator uh, rising and falling of water is in turn rotating the turbine with a good amount of energy and that is in turn helping to produce the electricity so that is how it works right so during high tide the sea water flows into the reservoir of the barrage and turns the turbine which in turn produces electricity very simple and the reverse process takes place during the low tide so this sea water that is stored in the barrage that flows out into the sea and again the flowing water turns the turbine so what we have done we have created a barrier at the back of the barrier there is a storage space that you can call as a reservoir or a barrage reservoir so during high tide when the water enters this reservoir it rotates the turbine and hence electricity production begins and when it goes back when it recedes back into ocean again it rotates the turbine and thereby leading to the generation of electricity however the harnessing tidal energy is little bit expensive that means the setup the overall setup of the tidal energy is definitely expensive but overall maintenance cost is comparatively low you can say the running cost of the project is comparatively low so in india the best sites for exploiting the tidal energy are the gulf of kutch the kambay and the sundarban regions other areas where we can harness the tidal energy are the island nations are the sorry the island districts you can say or the island areas because they are the part of the country itself okay so let me correct my words here they are the part of the country itself so we definitely we can, cannot call them individuals right so andaman and Laksh uh, andaman and nicobar and the lakshadweep islands they are the majority regions where we can experiment out with the tidal energy so they are the good regions where we can find the tidal power right now it's a huge chapter and we are trying to achieve a huge feat see i'm not getting tired at all why because i am there for you people right so similarly you also do not have to give it up you don't have to get tired you have to be there throughout the session because this is going to help you grasp this is a magic portion that can help you cover the things in one and a half to two hours itself right so that is how it works so you have to be that you have to pat yourself come on you can do it you can do that right so basically when you're talking about the geothermal energy when you're talking about the geothermal energy so when the heat obtained from the earth so what is geothermal basically when you're talking about geothermal thermal here clearly means stands for heat geo clearly stands for geo here clearly stands for very simple that is from the earth from the earth or from beneath the earth okay fair enough now so basically the when the heat obtained from the earth from inside the surface of the earth when it is used to produce electricity that is called as geothermal power or geothermal electricity right now we know that the interior of the earth is pretty hot we can utilize that energy right so the heat energy at times it may appear it may come up to the surface of the earth in the form of water springs for example manikaran in himachal pradesh if you visit manikaran gurdwara there is a manikaran gurdwara out there so it has hot springs of water okay so that hot springs are nothing but the geothermal energy so basically this energy seeps out to the surface of the earth in the form of hot springs at times and that can be utilized to generate electric power right now the extremely high temperatures in the geothermal reservoir reservoir is again a kind of water body that is created where water can be collected and utilizing that hot water we can generate out the electricity okay definitely converting it that into steam so hot water is pumped out from deep underground through a well under high pressure so what we do is we dug out a well we dig out a well and under high pressure we just try to bring that boiling water to the surface so we try to bring that boiling water to the surface now as soon as that water is about to reach the surface we drop the pressure so immediately when you drop the pressure that water converts to steam 
and from that stream we used to turn it into uh, rotate the turbine which an again again is connected to the generators which again produces the electricity so understand the phenomena here how we are doing it what we are doing it using the wells we are trying to take out that water that hot boiling water from the surface of the earth so under high pressure remember that pressure is, is very mandatory so under high pressure we are trying to extract that water the moment we bring that water to the surface of the earth we drop the pressure as a result the water gets converted to steam and that is then further utilized to uh, to rotate the turbines and connected with generators that reduces the electricity so when water reaches the surface the pressure is dropped and the water turns to steam which in turn rotates the turbine so that same process repeats so the steam cools off in the cooling tower so there is a cooling tower where subsequently the steam cools down and when the steam cools down it condenses again to form the water then again that water is pushed back into the surface okay we do not waste it out so basically what whatever is required we just take it out rest of the water we again push it back to the surface and again the water gets heated up the process cools on repeating right so this is how we harness the geothermal power or geothermal energy like puga valley in ladakh it's our very important site of geothermal power then we have manikaran in himachal pradesh if you get the chance do visit that okay now if you talk about the distribution of geothermal power if you talk about the distribution of geothermal power you will be amazed to know that india has a potential of 12000 megawatts of geothermal energy that means we have the potential of producing 12000 megawatts of geothermal energy in india the geothermal plants are located in manikaran in himachal pradesh and puga valley in ladakh so these are the two major junctions two major areas so we can what we have done is wherever the hot springs are available wherever these hot springs are available geothermal hot springs are available we have grouped them together and we have divided them into certain regions or provinces okay they are also called as geothermal regions or geothermal provinces now let us try to understand what are the different geothermal provinces or regions so these regions are the himalayan geothermal province naga lushai geothermal province andaman and nicobar island geothermal province kambe graben ठीक है दैट इज नियर बाय द गुजरात वाला पॉइंट सोन नर्मदा ताप्ती ग्राबिन वेस्ट कोस्ट दामोदर वैली महानदी वैली एंड गोदावरी वैली सो दीज आर द डिफरेंट काइंड्स ऑफ प्रोविंसेस और रीजन दैट वी हैव डिवाइडेड इनटू सो व्हाट वी हैव डन इज वेयर एवर दीज हॉट हॉट स्प्रिंग्स आर प्रेजेंट वी हैव ग्रुप देम टुगेदर एंड वी हैव नेम देम एज एज अ जियोथर्मल प्रोविंस ओके इन योर एनसीईआरटी इज वी मणिकारे इन हिमाचल एंड पुगा वैली इन लद्दाख दैट्स ऑल द एग्जांपल्स एडिशनली इफ समवन आस्क यू कैन राइट अबाउट दिस एज वेल ओके that is something extra something additional okay so now you must be saying that sir you are fooling us since a long time well i am not fooling you since a long time so we have just three more pages to go i won't call them slides they are jolly pages from your notebook so we are trying to grasp back so we'll talk about biogas apart from biogas we'll talk about the mineral conservation apart from that we'll say you sayonara okay so that's all i need your attention for 10 more minutes for 10 more minutes i need your attention that's all i need that's all i need yeah okay so basically when you talk about biogas biological gas right that is something that is a gas produced out of organic waste okay very very simple and when you talk about gobar gas we are talking about the gas that is produced with the help of animal excreta the cow excreta mixed with certain organic waste right organic or inorganic waste now when you are talking about shrubs farm waste animal human waste so they can be used to produce biogas for domestic consumption in rural area so all this wasted material that is allowed to decompose under certain conditions which in turn produces which in turn produces the gas right now what is happening here so what we do is we decompose the organic matter and with the help of that we start, we are able to produce the gas so this has higher thermal efficiency when we compare it with kerosene kerosene is again a product of the crude oil okay so crude oil so we can extract kerosene out of it so when you talk about the thermal efficiency the kind of uh, you can say performance uh, this particular biogas achieves or is able to produce that is far better than kerosene oil and dung cake or the charcoal so if you are burning any of any of them as a combustible substance so far better than that is your biogas okay now biogas plants has been set up at the municipal cooperative and individual levels as well that means government is also making efforts to set up the biogas plants apart from that individual people have also set up the biogas plants at their places now the plants that use cattle dung are called as the gobar gas plants so we all know that what is gobar in hindi in english it is called as the cow dung basically the excreta of the cow right so the plants that utilize this excreta they are specifically called as the gobar gas plants that are present in the rural areas now this provide two in benefits to the farmer number 1 first of all they provide the form of energy and second 
improved quality of manure so basically it, we just discussed a uh, few moments back that cow dung is again a very important source of manure natural organic manure that is provided like that there is available to the farmers okay so in, with respect if we compare this with respect to like all the fertilizers and all that is like chemical fertilizers so basically it's far better than that because this is not going to degrade the quality of the soil additionally it improves the soil fertility so that you can say a feather in the cap you can say or additional benefit you can say so that's again an achievement of the biogas okay so there are two fold benefits of the biogas number one it is a form of energy that can be utilized for the domestic purposes and apart from that it also improves the quality of manure available to the farmers so it basically increases the options right now biogas by far is the most efficient use of the cattle dung okay burning the cattle dung or making the cow dung cakes out of it is not going to help because that is again very not environment friendly you can say so biogas is by far the most amazing usage that we can uh, make out of the cow dung it improves the quality of manure and prevents the loss of trees and manure due to burning of fuel wood so basically you don't have to cut the trees and that will uh, basically basically in rural areas what happens people they cut down the trees to you know for burning for purposes so that they can cook the food over that chulha that they are, they are using right that stove that they are using so basically it eliminates the usage of collecting that firewood so that biogas is really important one hey thereby conserving the biodiversity now there's a big question at the end of everything that is the conservation now conservation conservation means protection of certain kind right see we all know that we have utilized over utilized over exploited the minerals and energy resources and now we have started to awaken ourselves now yeah we have started to understand that it's really important that we need to preserve them otherwise we'll run out of them and then no existence will be in danger so what do we do generally why it is required promotion of energy conservation and increased use of renewable sources are the twin planks of sustainable energy when you talk about sustainable energy management then we are talking about two different points number one we are talking about energy conservation second we are talking about usage of renewable sources of energy or non conventional sources of energy so these are the two major benefits out of the sustainable energy right so india is presently one of the least energy efficient countries in the world and that's something not to be proud of it india is the least energy efficient country in the world which means that a whole amount of work has to be done in this area that is we are over utilizing our resources but at the same point of time it is really necessary that we need to conserve them as well because india's population is growing at a rapid pace and so are the demands of the population hence it is really very very important that we need to find out a sustainable way to manage our minerals and energy resources otherwise very soon we are going to run out of that right so that is the you can say that the moment of the that is the need of the hour that we need to do something very exponentially in terms of this right when you talking about sustainable energy management now okay so we have to adopt a very cautious approach for very judicious uses like for example we all love to travel by cars you know we all love to have our individual cars but let's let's give a thought for the moment if there is one person driving a car to the office that is situated at say 10 or 15 kilometers and apart from that there is an alternative public transportation also available why not to switch over that basically it will reduce the cost because petrol and diesel are not very uh, you know cheap right they are expensive definitely they are so it will not only reduce the traveling cost but also it will you know contribute your part towards environmental protection because we all think that what is going to happen if we don't go to office by car you know if we don't use our private vehicle so that's only one private vehicle just imagine if people start thinking that only one vehicle can also make a difference and thousand people start thinking the same way then definitely we have a considerable amount of you can say that you know changes that can come so it all depends upon so we we especially on this occasion i very remember you know very fondly i would like to <laughs> quote uh, mahatma gandhi that be the change you wish to see in the world i think it's mahatma gandhi is a martin luther king's quotes i'm not exactly remembering it so apologies for the same so if i'm i may be wrong in this because i'm not quoting the right person here i'm not very sure about this but do i yeah i do remember the quote so i will just keep it very simple let us quote the quotation forget about who said that okay so it's like be the change you wish to see in the world so the change has to come from within the change has to come from us so if we are are in the pioneers of the change we can't expect others to change right so we have to set the examples ourselves for example we can 
use public transportation we can use individual instead of individual vehicles switching off the electricity when not in use power saving devices can be used instead of you know so there are multiple uh, things out there so after all we should remember one simple point that energy saved is energy produced so whatever energy you are going to save in turn that means very very simple we are also going to produce it right means that means rightful use of energy is the need of the hour okay so it was a long journey isn't it it was a long journey so at the end of the journey i have few questions to ask number one suggest me any three you three ways in which you can contribute for energy conservation okay you have to suggest me any three ways in the comment section in which you can contribute for the energy production okay or the energy uh, conservation fine production you can't produce right you conserve you can conserve that so basically suggest me three ways that you can do your on your part to preserve uh, or conserve energy resources right and one more point always in life there are moments when you feel tired when you feel exhausted when you feel that you are about to give it up but remember those are the moments that you have to be the strongest because those moments are the ones that are really the testing times it will test your patience it will test your threshold it will test your skills abilities and everything and if you stand firm in those situations believe me the next phase is going to be very smooth for you because once you surpass that particular moment of pressure you pass that threshold then you are confident enough to ace anything that comes in your way right and that is how when we talk about successful people it's not just that they are successful just because they have done enough amount of hard work no they have faced failures they have learned from their failures they have improvised upon their failures and they have learned to react over their failures in a positive and constructive way and that is what is required from each one of us when you're talking about failures when you're talking about getting exhausted when you're talking about getting demotivated right so always we always have long long classes you know so because we want uh, definitely my approach is to like you know teach you lots and lots of things in less amount of time but since everything is so huge it it may be very much it is very very human you know to make get distracted at sometimes but it all depends upon us because these two hours are really going to be a lot of you know changing the game for you because in small period of time you are able to you know grasp the entire topic the entire chapter and this is going to be very handy when you are sitting for your board examination right however they are also approaching they are very near so in next 3 to 4 months you will be sitting in a board exams but i believe that if you are very consistent with whatever you do no one can stop you from achieving what you are wishing for right so on this note let me take your uh let me take your permission to basically go and come back with another mind blowing and amazing topic till then sayonara bye bye stay happy stay healthy stay smiling and stay tuned with pw bye bye